Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you. Please take your seats. I love being with you guys. When I get the call and they say, will you come? I say yes, and then I go and cancel everything else and so I can be with you guys. I don't care who the other people are. As long as I can be with you guys, it's fantastic. So, brilliant. And I'm here to let you know that on Wednesday, we're going to even it up, all right? We're going to even it up. You got Billy back. Billy. Yes. The divine Billy Slater. So he's back on site. It's like having the Holy Spirit in your life when you've got Billy Slater on your team, isn't it? It's, uh, things go better that way. So we're going to win. We're going to win. Fantastic. I am a Queenslander when it comes to state of origin. <laughs> eh? That's right. Because I support a Queensland team called the Melbourne Storm. <laughs> They're all Queenslanders. Yeah, so why wouldn't you? Uh, just seeing the stuff that you guys are doing and the way that you're engaged and reading through this is really, really impressive. I want to say, you, you know, you're, you're doing significant things. Uh, I know it's difficult when you come to church every week and you just see this expression of your church, and you tend to think that the things you see is the expression of your church. But, you know, you're only seeing a little bit of what your church is actually doing. You can never see it all. Your church is having an effect when you're asleep. You know that? It's still ministering to people while you are taking your, your, your rest. And, uh, you know, when, you, when you're having a down day, the church keeps going. You know? And when you're not engaged, the church is still engaged. Because it's, uh, it has a ministry that operates 24 hours around the world. And it's constantly reaching people and touching lives and seeing transformations made. And it's, a, it's an awesome ministry that your church has. And your engagement with us in mission, your support with us in mission is, uh, well, if I said it was appreciated, I'd just be simply not saying enough. It's absolutely essential to what we do. You make it possible for our missionaries to do some pretty amazing things and to be in some pretty challenging places. And you make it possible for us to reach out and touch the lives of people and make a real difference and in, in many, many lives, thousands and tens of thousands, literally, of lives. So I, I want to thank you for that. I've come to share the Word of God with you today. So before that, I'd like to tell you a story. Would you like to hear a story? It's, it's a romance story. You like a romance story? The Bible has a few of them, you know, that really are better than Mills and Boone. You know, there's Samson and Delilah. That didn't turn out too well. Uh, you've probably seen the movie. Um, then there's uh, my favorite, Ruth and Boaz, which is the romance story I want to talk to you about today. For those of you that don't know, Ruth was not a Jewish lady. She was actually a Moabitess. Now, Moab was a a small country close to Israel. And in the past, before the book of Ruth was written, Israel had conquered Moab. And what they'd done, uh, I won't go into all the complicated details about it, but they'd made all the Moabite people to be sort of like domestics and slaves. So they had to carry the water, they had to do all the hard work. So they, after a while, when the kingdoms changed around a little bit and shifted you see what happened was that uh, the Moabite people had a deep resentment for the people of Israel they were of a different culture a different religion but there was also a very deep resentment they detested Israel now for some reason we don't know why possibly business uh, a woman by the name of Naomi and her husband and two sons went into the land of Moab and lived there for a number of years. So long, in fact, that their two sons married two Moabite women. Now, it came to pass, as the Bible says, that her husband died, but so did both of her sons-in-laws. So now this woman is left without any men, no sons and no husband. But she's left with two daughters-in-law. Now, according to the tradition of the time, the daughters-in-law would now return to their families. They'd go back home to their mothers and fathers who would take care of them and arrange for them to marry another man, if that was possible. So she said to her daughters-in-law, you, know you know the culture, you can go back now if you like. One said, thanks, mum, and off she went. The other one, Ruth, said, I'm not going. I'm going to stick with you. Where you go, I go. I want to take care of you. You have nobody to take care of you, so I'm going to take care of you. Now, that was unprecedented. It, it, it was really quite an amazing thing for her to do because she's acting against culture. 
She's asking, acting against logic, if you think about it. This is an act of compassion. It doesn't make sense that she would do this sort of thing. But she did. She said, I I'm going to work to help support you. So her mother-in-law said, well, look, this is what we're going to do. We're not going to stay here in Moab, because if we stay here, there's a famine on, we're going to die. I'm going to take you to Israel with me. It you'll be all right. Just come with me. Because Israel is a nation that understands compassion for its poor. So they went to Israel. But it seems that Naomi had a plan. Because when they got there, Naomi said to Ruth, look, there's lots of people out in the fields. It's harvest time. And um, if you go out into the fields as a poor person, you just come walk behind the people who are reaping. Anything they drop on the ground, they're not allowed to turn around and pick it up. They've got to leave it there so that the poor people can come and pick it up and live off it. So this was uh, the compassion of Israel, written into the law, so that there was this compassion idea that poor people could live off the things that dropped to the ground from the reapers. And that's what she said to Ruth to do. Go follow them, but don't go anywhere. I want you to go only to one man's farm, and his name is Boaz. Just go there. She didn't tell her wife. Just go to Boaz's field. So Ruth did as she was told. She gets up before the sun rises, gets out into the fields, watches what everybody's doing, starts following behind the reapers and picking up any handfuls of grain that had fallen on the ground. At the end of the day, she takes them home, grinds them up, makes bread, and that's the meal for her and her mother-in-law. Whatever she can make of the things that fell to the ground. So it's a subsistence living, very poor. They remained in poverty. She went day after day. And of course, she must have been a very good looking lady. Because at one stage, Boaz turns around to all the young guys who are in the harvest, young guys, notice, and he says to them, who is that good looking chick over there? <laughs> ah, she'd got his attention. And they said, oh, you don't know who she is? Wow, this is that woman. Remember, everybody's talking about her. She's the Moabite lady who came with her mother-in-law to Israel to take care of her. Whoa, that's the one? That's the one that did this? That's the one that was that crazy? That's amazing. So now he said, listen, tell you what to do, boys. Drop more stuff for her. I don't want her going anywhere else. I want her to turn up here every day, so drop plenty of stuff so she won't go anywhere else. Something was happening. So I began to drop more and more stuff. Ruth goes home and says to her mother-in-law, you wouldn't believe what's happening here. It's just amazing. She says, keep on going. So one day, Ruth decides, you know, uh, Boaz decides that he's going to sort of take it up a notch. You know what I mean, guys? You know what I mean? He's going to take it up a notch. So he says to her, uh, well, um, uh, would you have lunch? Yeah, okay, come over here, sit down. So he sit, she sits near him, and he gives her a little bit of bread, and they're having lunch together, and, uh, you know, he appreciates what she does. And then he comes to the punchline, and he says, in Ruth chapter 2, verse 12, the Lord repay your work, he said to her, and a full reward be given to you by the Lord God of Israel, under whose wings you have come for refuge. In other words, he says, God bless you for what you're doing. You are a wonderful lady. God, I pray that God will bless you. I pray that God will, you know, as he says, you know, reward you, give you a full reward and cover you with his wings. Wasn't that nice? So she goes home and she tells her mother-in-law. Mother-in-law says, okay, now we go to phase two. <laughs> phase two. What do you mean? Well, I want you to go back this time, but go at night time. Don't go in the day. Oh, go at night time. At night time, the young men and everybody else who've been working in the fields all day and grinding the corn, they get tired. So what happens is they sleep there. They sleep at the place where they gather the grain and grind the grain. I want you to go there. I want you to find Boaz. You'll know him. He's the owner. He has a special little spot. Go to him. Yeah? Find him. When you find him, I want you to lie at his feet. Now, notice, lie at his feet. All right? So, 
No, no, nothing happened, all right? What's happening is Boaz is, say, lying in this direction. She has to lie in that direction. So she has to take a piece of the bottom of his cloak and put it over her and lie on the ground. Fortunately, this is not wintertime. This nice warm nights. So she lies there, just stays there till the morning. When he wakes up in the morning, he suddenly finds he has a woman, a woman at his feet. So he jumps up. No, whoa, a woman. No, nothing happened. Nothing, nothing. No, no, definitely nothing happened. All the young men are looking. Whoa, what happened? What happened? What happened? What happened? Huh? Who are you, he says. Because his light is just coming up and he can't quite see clearly. And listen to what she says. Chapter 3, verse 9. Who are you, he asks. So she answered, I am Ruth, your maidservant. Take your maidservant under your wing, for you are a close relative. Now, do you notice the contrast here? He said to her, God bless you. God provide for you. God reward you for all the good that you've done. And may God put you under his wing. We'll be praying for you. God bless you. What essentially she comes back and says to him is, that's not enough, buddy. You have a bigger responsibility than that. Just saying, God bless you, I'll pray for you is not good enough. You should put me under your wing. Your wing. You have a responsibility. And I'm calling you on it. Put me under your wing. Don't just pray that you'll be under God's wing. There's a similar echo in the New Testament, isn't there? When James speaks to us in chapter 2, verse 16, and says, and one of you says to them, the poor, depart in peace and be warmed and be filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body. What does that profit? So if we say to somebody, God bless you. Yeah, God put you under his wings. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Hallelujah. Yes, we'll pray for you. Amen. Praise God. What does that profit anybody unless you actually do something? And this is what's happening in the book of Ruth. Ruth is basically saying, I left everything. I left behind my country, my culture, my family. I made a great sacrifice. And I come here to take care of this woman. And you say to me, God bless you. Well, hey, buddy, you've got to do better than that. That's our challenge, isn't it? Because see, Ruth, to us, is like a missionary. She made great sacrifices, leaving behind her own culture, the place of comfort. She left behind her own language group, all her favorite foods, all her friends, all her connections, everything. And she went to a foreign land from compassion in order to help, in order to be a provision in order to be a blessing. She left that place with great sacrifice and went to another place. And when she went there, the third point is, it is not good enough to say, the Lord bless you. She's saying, I need your engagement. I need your involvement. I need you to do something. And let me say about our missionaries, many of which you, you, you in, in this phenomenal vision that you have and what you're doing, you support many missionaries, good people, people like the Boyles and people like the Hildons who've left their own country, people like you know, the Winchesters who've left their own place, making great sacrifice from compassion, going to another place and leaving everything behind to do that. And it, it is not right for us to say, God bless you. We have to say, you go, we'll cover you. You go, we'll stand with you. We just don't want to say that God, God put his wings over you. We want to be the wing of God over you. We want to extend our wing as if it is the wing of God. We want to be your provider. We want to be your helper. We want to be your supporter. We'll make it possible for you to do what God has sent you to do. And that's what I love about your mission program, because you're extending the wings of your compassion and generosity over many people that are doing many great things. Those things wouldn't be possible if we just prayed for them. It wouldn't be possible if we just say, well, God bless you. And I thank God for you as a church, because you've gone beyond the God bless you church. 
that I'll pray for you, church. You've gone beyond that into an engagement. It says, oh, no, 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 we've got a greater responsibility than that. We're, we're going to do something. We're going to make some sacrifices. We're going to be generous. We're going to engage with you. We're going to make it possible for you. And that's what I see here between this man, Boaz, and Ruth. That he rose to his opportunity. He rose in generosity. He rose in responsibility. And he fulfilled the purpose of God by being the wing of God to this woman. Boaz draws our attention to a few other things. You see, as long as he's dropping grain on the ground, and it was a nice thing to do, very charitable thing to do, feed the poor, drop it on the ground. But as long as she's living on the handfuls of grain that are being dropped, she's going to be poor forever. She'll never rise above poverty. She'll get enough to eat, but only just enough to eat. She'll always be poor. She'll have to go and, and find something. When the harvest season is finished there, she'll have to move somewhere else where they're dropping something else or get a handout from somebody else because she's going to be perpetually in poverty because all she's receiving is charity. Now, charity is nice, but it doesn't release anybody from poverty. We are not called to engage just in charity. When we engage in charity, it should be in order to keep people alive so that we can help them break out of poverty. But we do not engage in charity alone that keeps people poor forever. We have to do more than that. We have to ask ourselves a question, why is there poverty? And then we have to ask ourselves a question, how can we help remove this poverty from this community of people? And that's what you do. You're supporting community transformation in a village in Vietnam. Why are you doing that? Because, well, look, you know, you could go in every day and feed every kid in the village, but they'd stay poor forever, wouldn't they? You could, you could feed the children in 10 villages, 50 villages, 100 villages, but what would happen? You keep them poor forever. There is no point in perpetually feeding children. What we have to do is ask why they are poor and deal with that issue. The money we spend on feeding the poor and keeping them poor can be spent on resolving the problems that cause poverty. And that's what you're doing in Vietnam. You're not going in to hand out food and then come back the next week and hand out food or give out bags of rice. No, you're not doing that. You're actually saying, what causes poverty? Let's deal with it. So we engage in better crop protection production. We engage in better health. We, we engage in better education. We engage in micro enterprise. We teach them how to rise above poverty so that there is no one in the village that's suffering poverty, that every child is being fed adequately, not just on a subsistence living, that we're helping them rise above poverty so the next generation will be ahead of the last generation and will be better educated and better fed and, uh, and, and better health so that they will never again sink into that poverty. And we'll go from community to community to community to community and transform and change them. We don't have to stay there forever. We can do this in a span of four or five years, but then we can move to the next community. But if you're just feeding the hungry, you'll be there forever. And that's why we, we ACC Mission, we don't raise money to feed children. Why would we? Why would we do that when our responsibility is to help the whole community come out of poverty? Why would we feed children and keep them in poverty? Why wouldn't we just use that money and deal with the root cause? Why are they hungry? And let's solve that problem. It's why we don't go into a community and take children out and put them in an orphanage. We go into the community and transform the whole community. So that the children don't need an orphanage, they can stay with their family, they can stay with their community, they can stay within their culture, within their language, they can stay home. The solution to poverty is not to just feed the kids and steal the kids. The solution to poverty is going to find out what's happening, which is what you're doing in Vietnam. And I'm hoping that when you're finished in that village, you go do another one. And when you're finished in that village, you go do another one. And when you're finished in that village, you keep going and keep going and keep going, keep going, because we've got to go to village, to village, to village, to village, and make these transformations happen in people's lives. And in the end, instead of just, just keeping a few hundred kids fed, 
you will transform the lives of thousands. Thousands. Boaz had to learn the difference between just dropping a handful, which is charity, and transforming a life, which is justice. Amen? We need to learn the same thing. You are already doing it. Amen? I want you to see what happens also here. You know, it's a nice romantic story. They get married, as you, you probably know. They get married. Okay? And then what happens is, of course, you've got two people who sort of met in a cornfield. Not the ideal place to meet, is it? They met in a cornfield, and then basically she sort of proposed to him, didn't she? Step up, buddy. Uh, you know, so she... He basically went down. Yeah, we know that there was a, an attraction from Boaz to her, but it was a bit of a funny one. And they had to go down, and he had to do a deal, and he had to do this, and, and eventually he married this woman. That You can't say that they fell head and heels in, over heels in love with each other. It wasn't one of those Mills and Boons moments, you know. Oh, not that I've ever read it, Mills and Boons, but I'm just telling you what I've been told that they say. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't one of those moments. But you know, it became one of those things. They became loving. They made commitment to each other. And, and it became passionate. How do you know that? They had a child. And, and what you see from this, which is really important for me, is when you begin to engage with something, you don't always begin with passion. Sometimes you begin on the basis of acknowledging responsibility and need. Hmm? You don't have to wait for the passion. You acknowledge the responsibility and the need. But then as you begin to engage, then you enter into better relationship and passion comes. I'm saying to you that when you're looking at this thing here and you're saying, what will I do with my church? Don't sit there and wait for a warm, fuzzy feeling to come over you. Don't sit there and wait and say, oh, but I don't, I don't feel the, I don't feel it, bro. I just don't feel it. No, no, hang on. Whoa, 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 back up a bit. You don't need to feel anything. You just need to know your responsibility. You just need to know the need. And you need to say to yourself, there's a need and I'm responsible and I'm going to do what I can. And when you do that, I tell you, the passion comes. The passion comes. You talk to anybody who's passionate about mission and who has a sense of achievement and purpose because of mission. They, they didn't, it didn't start that way. So what happens now? Well, it's interesting, isn't it? Because this is a great story because it has an influence that is way beyond its uh, original con conception. Because, see, Boaz and Ruth get married, and as I said, they have a child. Now, the name of that child is uh, Obed. Obed. Remember him? Nope. Neither do I. Um, so they had a child named Obed. Obed, he got married. And th he had a child, and that child was called Jesse. Now, you do know him because he got married, and after having a few sons, he had David. So now what you have is Ruth and Boaz, through this amazing encounter, they eventually make it possible for their great-grandchild, David, to be born. David, the great king of Israel, who, incidentally, gets married a few times, has a few kids, none of which are of great consequence, but eventually their kid gets married to their kid who gets married to their kid who gets married to their child who has a child who has a child who has a child who becomes Jesus Christ, Son of God, Messiah. But when Ruth went out to pick up the stuff off the ground, and when Boaz says, who's that good-looking chick over there, they weren't thinking about producing Messiah, were they? He didn't look at her and say, you know, if I married a woman like that, we could produce the Messiah. No, that wasn't, that wasn't what was in their minds or in their hearts. This was just a natural process. You see, God is at work to produce a greater destiny, a, a greater outcome, a greater influence than they had ever dreamed was possible 
And it started when Boab realized his responsibility and was prepared to be generous. And when he extended his wing over her, little did he know that he would become the great-grandfather of the great King David and the great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-grandfather of the Messiah. He didn't know. But that day, his destiny changed. His future changed because he committed to be the wing of God. I want to say to you today, when you think about what am I going to do, I'm saying to you this. Listen, folks. When you decide to engage, you change your destiny. You change your destiny. I want to say something to you right now, which I'm not sure if you really can grasp it at the moment. Or not because I'm, you know, but it takes a bit. That, let me say this to you. There are your destiny in life is not fixed. There are pathways, intersections. You make a choice, it goes that way. You make another choice, it goes that way. This is an intersection. You can say, forget it, they're just after my money. Forget it. You know, everybody just wants something from me. Why should I be doing anything else? You could say, I can't afford it. I don't want to do it. There can be a million reasons why you decide to go this way rather than that way. But when you say, I will do something, I will do what I can. That's all that God is asking you to do. I will do what I can. I will extend my wing over those who are in need. I will extend my wing over these missionaries who are going. I will be the wing of God, the provision of God. I will do to the best of my ability what I can do. When you do that, you choose another path at this intersection of life, which leads you on to a different destiny, which leads you on to greater influence than you ever thought was possible. It takes you in a direction that because of the choice of your generosity and grace. You see what I'm saying to you today? Thank God you go to a church that gives you that opportunity. Thank God. Thank God you're in a church that says, listen, we want to help you set yourself on the right path for God's great destiny to be filled, fulfilled in your life. Because see, what's happening now, and, and I just want you to get this idea. Young David is born into this house. Was his grandma, great-grandma still alive? Possible, possible, definitely possible. Certain, don't you think? Certain that he would have grown up with the story. Don't you reckon? Oh, yeah. As a little boy, he'd be told about grandma and grandpa and their amazing romantic encounter because they would tell him, you know, you're not really all Jewish. Oh, no, I am. Nah, no, nah, not really. You're not. No, you're not entirely Jewish, son. No, no, I, I am. I'm a, I'm just, no, no, no. Your, mother, your grandmother, great grandmother, she was a Moabite. So what? No. Terrible. Yeah, let me tell you the story. It's historic. So they, they bring him up, see, and they tell him the story. Uh, and he hear about what happened and, uh, it, uh, and how Boaz was challenged to extend his wing over her. Now do you know why David writes in the Psalms that you are under the wings of the Almighty? Where do you think he got the idea? He got it from his great-granddad. He got it from his great-grandma. He had a heritage, a heritage of grace, a heritage of generosity, a heritage of destiny. He understood like no one else. This had been placed in him because of the generosity of his great-grandparents. You see what happened? These two people, Ruth and Boaz, changed history. They set their kids up and their grandkids and their great-grandkids up with a heritage based on generosity, based on acceptance of our responsibility to meet the needs of those, based on the fact that we want to be, we desire to be the wing of God over those who are in need. And because they did that, they sowed something into their generation, the generation after them, their kids, their grandkids, and they grew up to become great leaders, significant men, historic men, history-changing men who understood something about God that was unique, they said, he puts his wings over his people. Where'd they get that? It was their heritage. 
What heritage will you set up for your children? Will they look back at you and say, I have a heritage of generosity. I have a heritage of compassion. I have a generosity of engagement. I have a generosity, you know, a, 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 a heritage of commitment. Or they're going to say, no, they never did anything, really. They choose the other way. They said they couldn't afford it. They were cynical and said they're just after my money. They said, what does it really matter anyway? They said, let somebody else do it. Is that what you're going to give your kids? Is that the heritage they're going to have? They're going to look back at grandparents who might as well not be there? Shadows in the past with no substance to them? Or are they going to look back to you and me and say, I stand on a great foundation. I face the world and my future on a foundation established by my grandparents and my great-grandparents, a foundation of grace, a foundation of faith, a foundation of generosity, a foundation that says, yeah, we're not going to let it pass. We have a responsibility. We're going to do something to change our world. Is that the heritage you're going to give your kids? Because that's what we're doing over the next few weeks. I know you just think it's a missions offering, but it isn't. It isn't. And I could come to you and say, listen, if you don't give anything, it doesn't matter because God will give it anyway. That you are not the source of supply, that Jehovah Jireh is the source of supply. So keep your money. We don't need it. I could tell you that. And I don't believe we would diminish in the provision of God one dollar. But I won't tell you that because it's not about you giving to us or to somebody else. It's about you becoming you becoming that person. You engaging in what God, in God's challenge. And you saying, I'm going to rise to it. I'm going to become the generous person. I'm going to become the faith person. I'm going to become the caring person. I'm going to become that compassionate person. I'm going to do something. I'm going to extend my wings. I'm going to cover those missionaries who go. I'm going to make it possible for them to go. I, I'm going to supply for those who are in need. I'm going to become that person. That's what this is all about. It's not about... You giving to something is you becoming something. Why do I tell you that? Why? Because that's the way we have to live, you and me. That's why this is just as important to me as it is to you. When I was a young man, that was a long time ago, I went to Bible college. But before I went, I'd made a decision. See, I approached this issue a little bit differently. Um, I decided when I was a young man that I was going to be a missionary. I didn't ask. I didn't pray about it. I said, I'm going to be a missionary. Why? Because there's a need. So I'm going. That was my approach, right? So I said to God, I'm going unless you tell me otherwise, I'll be off. Now, through a set of circumstances over a period of time, it was pretty obvious that God said, do not go or else. So I asked the question, if I'm not going, what should I do? And God said this to me. If you don't go, okay, you have to stay with purpose because you just can't stay. You just can't stay. Now, here's the call of God for us. It's the call of God to go. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. Yeah, sure. You already go into your neighbors. Yes, you are. Okay, yes. You go into your family. Yes, you are. That's good. That's fantastic. You're a witness. That's really good. You're evangelist. That's really good. But you know what? We have this thing called going to all the world. And I'm sorry to tell you, but your neighbor and your community is not the world. It's only the first step towards the world. So if you and I, you and me, decide not to go into all the world because we don't believe that that is the call of God for us to do that, then we must stay with purpose. And our purpose of staying is to support the church to witness in our world and to extend our wing of provision over those who do go. We stay with purpose. I made a commitment to God. Any church I pastor will be a strong missionary church. I didn't know how to do it. Didn't even know what it meant. I'd read about it. I knew that if I stayed, I had to stay with a purpose. And I have fulfilled that pledge. And now I've finished the last years of my ministry, making sure that that I can be involved in this and encouraging as many other churches as possible who are staying to stay with purpose. There is one purpose. 
Amen? There are some of you here today who, like Ruth, are called to go. Just a few, I know. Not many. There's never many. There's only a few. You're sitting here saying, you know, I, I, I feel maybe I should be going, but I don't know what to do. Well, that's okay. You, you don't need to know what to do. We can help you find it. And if you're like Ruth saying, I, I want to be committed and I want to go, I want to go. I want to get engaged. I wanna, I, I'm willing to leave behind my home, my culture, and my everything. And I'm willing to go and serve God in compassion, ministering to the needs of others. If that's you, then you need to see your pastor because he will talk to you and you and he can talk to us and we are committed to help you fulfill that call of God upon your life. If you are a Ruth here today, I want you to see your pastor. But for the rest of us who are not a Ruth here today, I want you to make an equally important commitment. I'm not going, but I am staying with a purpose. Amen. I'm staying with the purpose to make it possible for every one of those who go. I'm going to stay with the purpose to make it possible for them to go. I'm going to make it possible for this church to touch its community effectively. I'm going to make it possible for this church to enter its world and transform the lives of multitudes. I'm going to make this possible. That's why I'm staying. Stay with purpose. Stay with purpose. That's the challenge. That's the challenge that Ruth and Boaz give to me. The challenge is, what am I going to do now? Will I engage with purpose? Because I don't really think we have the option to do nothing. Yeah? Jesus does not give us the option to do nothing. Nowhere in the Bible or in the teachings of Christ is there an option to do nothing. Isn't that right? He even makes it simple for you by saying, if any one of you gives a cup of cold water, which is free, and freely available to all of you, to one of these little ones, then he's done it to me. He makes it so simple that the simplest and easiest things that we do are blessed by God as long as we understand we cannot do nothing. Amen. I'd like you to bow your heads and pray with me right now. If you feel the call of God upon your life, and you say, yep, I'm feeling a stirring in my spirit to go. I just want you to make this a moment of your commitment. A moment of your commitment. And I'm going to ask you just to raise your hand right now and say to God, I acknowledge I'm called. I acknowledge I'm called. That's me. Show me how to go. Is that you? Just raise your hand. Thank you. Raise your hand right now. I'm called. Thank you. Raise your hand right now. I'm called. I'm called. I'm called. I'm called. Thank you. Father, for those who raise